Hey everyone and welcome to another video. Coach Kurt Dog coming at you live. We're talking about champion pools today. And guys, sorry to break it to you, but I was wrong. You know, I'm a student of the game, both as a player and a coach, and I'm constantly updating my theory and hypotheses about major concepts. And um, as I'm always coaching and learning from my students, um, I've learned quite a few things about champion pools. So I'm really gonna share my findings today about what I was wrong about specifically. And you know, these are very important things that you need to consider for your champion pool moving forward. Now, fun and curiosity are gonna be the two themes of this video that I'm gonna be constantly referring to. So um, you're gonna be like, why the hell are we using these terms? I'm just gonna plant that seed in there and we'll kind of come back to this later on. First thing I wanna talk about is champion pool complexity. This is something that I completely and utterly disrespected in the past and something that I was very wrong on. Now on the left-hand side, I've got this goofy looking graph that I've put together. Um, and basically on the Y axis, we have reference point complexity. You can think of this in terms of like macro, right? In terms of the, the, the skill cap or the range of what that champion is capable of and how many options that champion has in terms of, a say from a macro perspective. And then we have on the x-axis mechanical complexity, right? So if we look at the top right quadrant over here, these are champions that have, you know, like Rise, very high reference point complexity. They can do many, many things in the game, but they're also very mechanically demanding. You know, and yes, you can nitpick this. I just did it for the sake, I just whipped it up very quickly for the sake of this example. I know people are gonna have arguments in terms of what should be where. I've just thrown it together. Don't get too bogged down in the details here. For the sake of this example, we've got Malzahar here on the bottom left, right? Very simple reference points, can't really do too much, very basic kit, mechanically quite easy, you know, easily in the bottom left quadrant. We have champions like Twisted Fate, who are, I would say are relatively mechanically easy, um, but probably not that far over. I would say probably somewhere in here, probably shot myself in the foot there, but definitely got a very high reference point complexity. And then you've got champs like Lucian who are very mechanically demanding, but in terms of their reference points, very simple. You're an 80 carry at the end of the day. You, very, you know exactly what you need to do. Now, the reason I threw this graph together and the reason we need to talk about champ pool complexity is because I've dug a hole for some clients where I've recommended them particular champ pools, but they're, they're, they're multiple champions from this top right quadrant. What I've realized is that especially in the lower elo brackets, it's near impossible to climb if your champion pool looks something like this. So this is an example of a bad pool. Silas, Zoe, Azir. So if you're a platinum four player and your pool has, you know, three champions from this top three uh, area, you're really gonna struggle. Your, your life is gonna be quite miserable because these are very high skill cap champions that require a lot of time and um, it's gonna be very hard. A good pool looks something like you've got maybe one champion from this top right, top right quadrant and maybe you know one or two champions from other categories where they're less mechanically demanding or you know less demanding from a macro perspective. So you really want that balance between complexity and you know, complex and simple. Now, yes, um, every player is different. I've met players that have played the game for like nine years. They have a sophisticated background in MOBAs, playing Dota and Horn, played PC since they were six years old, and they could probably play multiple complex champions. Then you've got other people that have just played League, they're a console gamer, and they can they might not even be able to play any complex champions, and they're better off actually playing champions down here in the bottom left. At the end of the day, I just wanna throw this out there. We're gonna refer back to this throughout the video, but it's a very important concept we need to consider when creating a champion pool. Now, the next concept that I've been experimenting with is champ pool cycling. So I'm gonna use an example to really explain this one. Let's take an average P4 player, right? And let's say this person has a champ pool of four, okay? There are two different, I would say, iterations of what the champion pool can look like. You could have a champ pool of one core champion and three complementary champions. Or you could have a champ pool of two core champions and two complementary champions. Now, what do I mean by this? So, let's say um, I, I absolutely love Victor, right? And I want to shape my entire identity as a player around Victor. So maybe that might be my one core champion. I could theoretically have two or three complementary champions that really shape or I guess fill the holes of bad Victor games and really, I guess, expand the uh, the depth of my pool. 
Um, now, the point of champ pool cycling is that you don't really cycle this champion at all. The victor in this case would stay solid. I would basically always keep my victor in my pool for the entirety of the season, and I wouldn't really touch it. What I would touch and what I would cycle through is these three complementary champions. So let's say for, for the sake of an example, I might have Galio, I might have Vex, and I might have Lissandra. These are three relatively simple champions, not overly mechanically demanding with clear reference points. I could theoretically throughout the year play maybe each and every one of these for two or three months and cycle them through and add another one in there. Okay, now the point of this is that I'm developing my mastery with my Victor and I'm not moving my Victor. I love my Victor, that's my baby here. But I can keep that fun and curiosity element throughout the season by alternating through these other three complementary picks. For other people, they might want to have two core champions that they shape their identity around. Maybe they love Victor and they love Cassio, but then they have two simple champions to round out the pool. Like I said, maybe a Liss and a Vex, but they can cycle through these. So they might play Liss, Vex, and then they maybe three months later, they might want to add in another simple champ maybe, and, and get rid of the Liss and play Dalio instead, get rid of the Vex and play Diana or something like that. That's the, the, that's the theory behind champ pool cycling. Right, and so there are a lot of benefits to long-term, uh, long-term benefits to cycling through champ pools. It actually broadens your perspective over the game rather than tunneling in and only viewing the game through one lens. It allows you to have better quality skirmishing because skirmishing is actually largely anticipation. What I've noticed with clients who only have a very narrow uh, lens or uh, yeah, very narrow lens of the game is that they struggle with skirmishing because they only view the game through this very particular way and and it's very difficult to see the game through what the enemy's going to do so the more champions you play over an extended period of time <clears throat> time sorry you can know or you're able to anticipate what they're going to do to you and that directly impacts your skirmishing you can have more empathy for others because you can understand why they're making mistakes better adaptability to metas this is not really that important of a point because i don't really care about meta but it is worth noting this is more important master plus but most importantly guys it increases fun and curiosity a lot of the time people get bogged down, right? They're like, oh, do I, do I have to go through another season where I'm only playing the exact same champions? If you're ever feeling like that and you're not having fun and you're not insanely curious about what you need to do to improve, you're really going to struggle to overcome those plateau points. So for me in 2020, in my 2023, sorry, my cycle would look something roughly like this. I would say Victor and Cassio are like my core two. Like they're my babies. They're not really going to shift. I'm always going to play Victor and Cassio. Then I might start theoretically by having, you know, these three as three, you know, Vex, Lissandra, Galio to cycle through. Very simple. I can add them in and out, things like that. But they complement a lot of the weaknesses that these two have. Then throughout the season, as patches change, you know, maybe I get, might get a little bit bored or uh, I feel as though there's an extra hole in my pool. You know what? I might swap one of these out. I might swap this Vex for an Ari. I might swap that Lissandra for a TF or something like that. And then I will cycle through these. Now, what might happen by the end of the season or halfway through the season, I might think, okay, I'm really liking TF. I might actually then add TF to my main thing, my main core two, drop down my Cassio, cycling Cassio, pick her up a few months later. These are the sorts of things you can do um, if you, if you continue the cycling process. And this is actually what I've done intuitively over a long period of time. And this is actually what a lot of high-low players do intuitively. Um, and over the time when you do this again and again, year in, year out, year in, year out, cycling through champions gets easier and easier and easier because your view of the game becomes more sophisticated. Now I do want to talk a little bit more about the importance of fun. One of my clients in the Midland Academy told me this story about a, he he was um, playing, he was actually getting taught by a piano teacher. And the piano teacher said, look, if you don't enjoy the music you're playing, you actually will get capped in terms of your ability. You, you, it's, it, without the fun element, you won't be able to connect with the music and you're just going to, you'll get stuck at a level. And so his theory was that, okay, the fundamentals of piano, in his case, are not going to change. The fundamentals are very, very important. So that always comes number one. Same thing for League. The fundamentals of the game never really change. You need to have good fundamentals. But instead of um, having champ mastery as number two, which for me, ch I put champ mastery usually in, in terms of significance number two, fun actually supersedes that. And, and fun, if you're not having fun, then champ ma mastery doesn't even matter because you'll get bogged down, you'll get beat down, you're going to look at all the negatives, you're going to have low confidence, 
You're just not gonna wanna get the reps in. So fun is actually more important and more significant than champ mastery. If you're having fun and you love the champion, then you can really develop that champion mastery. Um, it's the same thing for music in, in, in his case as well. So I thought I'd really wanna share that. And again, I'm really, really pushing the the importance of fun in the game. At the end of the day, we all played League because it was fun. If you're not having fun in your hobby, what's the point? It doesn't matter. Now, there are actually some dangers though of being a one trick. You know, you know, I'm not saying being a one trick is bad, but I do just want to quickly talk about this. I do believe I've had clients in the past that don't even really enjoy their champion anymore. They're only playing their one trick because it's like I've put so much time into playing this champion, I can't not play it. And at the end of the day, that's a very dangerous mindset because, again, you're lacking that fun, you're lacking that curiosity, and if you're only doing it because of the sunk cost fallacy, you put in all that time, you're really not going to probably overcome those plateaus. You're just going to be treading water. You're not going to go anywhere. External factors, maybe, you know, you've got a reputation in a Discord group or your friendship group or your team or whatever it might be. People have like this, you have like this reputation or expectation to uphold. Again, if you're not having fun, then screw it. Throw that to the side. That's not really important. If fun and curiosity needs to come first, and it's not a good enough reason to stick to being a one trick. Again, it won't be reliable in the long run. Self-perceived identity. You might only see yourself is only capable of playing that one champion, but that's just bullshit because you've just dug yourself that hole. And just because you played so much of that champion, you haven't got out of your comfort zone. You don't know what you're capable of. But note, this does not apply to everyone. I've met many, many, many one tricks and even inside the Midland Academy that love their one trick. They love that one champion. They couldn't care less about what anyone thinks of them. They don't care about meta. They don't care about getting counterpicked or any of that crap. They just love their champ. They have an absolute blast getting onto the rift. And um, they, you know, and I recommend those people stay being a one trick. You've got to be a very particular type of player to be a one trick. Now, there's some challenges during this whole thing. Um, you know, it's sometimes it's difficult for people to know if they're just coping or not. You know, how do we know if we're genuinely not having fun with our champion or we're just in a little bit of a rut and we're just facing some problems with our play? At the end of the day, guys, you really got to problem solve and you really got to ask yourself some tough questions. You know, have you genuinely been trying to problem solve? Have you been curious and tried to get outside perspectives and watch other people play that champion and see what they're doing and really get into the nitty gritty? If you haven't done that, then maybe it's not really about fun at all. You just haven't tackled that problem. And I truly believe that if you're honest with yourself, you'll know if it is that you're not having fun or you'll know if you're just in a rut. It's easier said than done, but it is something we really got to keep an eye on. Um, another thing that is quite tricky and there is no cookie cutter solution is knowing how many complex champions you as an individual are capable of playing. I know some people that can play many, many complex champions. There are other people that can't. At the end of the day, you should know your limits. You need to be honest with yourself. And look, you can always try one complex champion, say with two or three simple champs. And then if, if that feels pretty easily, pretty manageable, and you're climbing, you're doing good, maybe you can start adding in another one and slowly build it over time. I, I, would, I would recommend against overwhelming yourself and having that immediate uh, champ pool of three complex ones. That's not really the way to go. And then again, I get asked this question a lot, Curtis, well, I don't know what I have fun with. I genuinely don't know. I enjoy a lot of different champions. What I say to that is, you know, fun... I mean, fun is purely subjective. You know, it's it's what makes you feel a certain way. You're present in the moment, satisfied, content, whatever, um, like lost in the moment. At the end of the day, I would recommend playing a series of different champions. Like play a bunch of different champions. Screw the LP for now, just play a bunch of different champions. What really gets you excited? Like when you think of playing solo queue, what champion really excites you? A set of champions that really excite you and when you're on the rift, you're just having an absolute blast. If you're really honest with yourself over time, I think you'll know the answer. Again, it is a challenge that we face here. Now, there are things that have not changed in terms of my opinion on champ pools or things that have only slightly changed. The first one is that champ pool size, they still do need to be quite small. Like in gold, I still recommend you're only playing around two-ish champions. In plat, I still recommend three, at max four, but again, if you're playing four, there needs to be majority of them simple champions. In diamond plus and master plus, you know, you can have a champ pool of, I mean, I recommend four in diamond, no more than four. In master, you can theoretically have five and six, 
But again, you really got to find that balance between complexity and simplicity, depending on your personality, your and you know how much you're able to play the game. If you're not able to play the game that often, having multiple complex games is just not going to work. So yes, champel sizes still need to be considered and quite small. This one's an interesting one, having a clear player identity. I am still a massive advocate of having a clear player identity. So what I mean by that is when you're starting out, right? So especially when you're in gold and plat, you definitely don't want to be all over the place. So you don't want to have a champ pool that looks like this. You don't want to play Oriana and then Kiana and then um, let's say TF. Like what is the identity here? You know, or, you know, if you're having a hardcore mage and then a hardcore assassin, it's very difficult to know what your strengths are and what your skill set is. Ideally, you, you when you look at that person's champ you already know, you know, off, off the cuff, you know what sort of player they are. When you look at an OPGG and you see someone playing three mages like Victor, Cassiopeia, Vyga, you know what sort of player they are. If you look at someone's OPGG and they play Fizz and Zed, you know what sort of player they are. So my point is that especially when you're starting out, you don't want to spread yourself too thin. And I'll give you a horror story here. I actually really messed up a client because a client came to me and he's champ pool. He played Oriana and then he played Kiana, right? And what would happen is he would have a really tough game as Oriana and he'd be like, oh, I just died to this gank and my threat assessment wasn't good. And then the next game he plays Kiana and then you face a whole other series of differing problems. The problem with this is that it's very difficult to laser focus on a given learning objective because you're experiencing different problems with both of these champions. Um, so, you know, I should have at the start realized that, okay, Curtis, people like this, especially in like Plat, they can't do that. They need to have a clear player identity. That's my recommendation. Other people disagree. That's my recommendation from what I've seen. And then again, ideally you are covering multiple bases within a pool, right? You don't want to have overlap. Like there's no point in playing champs like Victor and Ori and Syndra. They're just three same champions. They do very similar things. You know, ideally your champ pool, you still have that similar identity, but they're filling different niches. A great example is playing, say, Victor, Cassio, and, excuse my writing, and uh, Vex. They're all three mages, but they, they play the game in a different way and fit differing drafts. That's a great example. Or you play Ari, um, you play Vygar, all mages, and then you play, again, Vex. These are all fill differing niches. You've got to find that balance, and every champion needs to be picked for a reason. Now, at the end, guys, you know, the analogy that really inspired me here when it comes to champ pools is the Rubik's Cube. If you give you know, a six-year-old kid or an eight-year-old kid a Rubik's Cube, someone that, you know, really found this Rubik's Cube very interesting, like, they're going to dive into it. They're going to they're gonna sit there and they're going to try and problem solve and figure out this puzzle, right? They're going to, and they're going to have a blast doing it. And if they don't have fun, they won't be curious. Curiosity and fun actually go hand in hand. You give that Rubik's Cube to another six or eight-year-old kid who couldn't care less about the puzzle and actually doesn't like puzzles, He's just going to kick it against the wall and play soccer with it. He won't give a shit. He won't even attempt to problem solve because he's not having fun with it. So at the end of the day, guys, um, you got to have fun with your pool and in the game. You got it. And that fun is going to lead to curiosity and they go hand in hand. And the whole point of this stuff, you know, understanding champ pool complexity, understand champ pool cycling and, and all that stuff. Um, it's to keep you fresh, your mind fresh, being looking forward to playing each and every block get those raw games in, season in, season out. And that's how you're really going to get results, guys. So um, let me know if you have any comments, thoughts, whatever. Um, otherwise, I will be floating around the comments. Cheers and thanks for watching.